So we all know that in our society there is a stratospheric divorce rate, right? Well over half the marriages um, in, in contemporary society break up. And, and we all know that the principal reason for these breakups is infidelity. And we can assume that of the remaining couples, not all of them are ecstatically happy, but they are staying together um, for the sake of something, the economics of it, for the sake of the kids, whatever. But you can see there's a pattern here of some considerable unhappiness. And even though we know all of this, when the infidelity finally comes to light, it's always treated like a cataclysm, as if it's never happened before, and oh my god, I'm shattered by it. And then people behave with, uh, well, great finality, and they break up their relationships. They bust up families. They cast children adrift. They enter into these savage wars of divorce. We're all familiar with that. And sometimes you think, what's the big deal? So he went on a trip, and he went to a bar, and he was a little lonely that night, or something got him excited and interesting, and is that really worth breaking up 10, 15, 20 years of a relationship? The toll that it takes on a personal economy, as well as obviously a family. And that's why I was so riveted when I came across uh, this couple, Christopher and Casilda, because they are a longtime married couple. Uh, 12 years, is it? Yeah, yeah. And Christopher is a research psychologist, and, and Casilda is a practicing psychiatrist. And uh, I think they are perhaps among the bravest people that I have ever met, because they are taking direct aim at the standard narrative. They do it with a considerable amount of academic support, and I'm going to let them take up the story. So this is Christopher and Casella. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here, uh, to be idea citizens, I guess is what we are, right? Um, before we get into the presentation, I just want to explain why this is a special honor for me personally, um, because um, when we, the, the, the book is based on my doctoral research and uh, when I was writing the book as I was coming to the end, near the end of the manuscript, uh, I started thinking about how I was going to thank Casilda for, I don't want to get emotional here, oh my god, <laughs> uh, f for so much that she did to help with the book and uh, you know, a little uh, acknowledgement at the beginning of the book wasn't going to cut it. And I realized that the book wouldn't exist without her insight and her support. And uh, even on a scientific level, so much she brought as a psychiatrist, as a medical doctor, as a woman, as an African. And I said, you have to be co-author. There's no way. Uh, this isn't my book. This is our book. And uh, to my surprise, she was very resistant. And, uh, but I kept pushing, and finally, she said... Okay, but you do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to do all the talking. So this is to explain why we're doing a bit of a pen and teller up here today, uh, with me being the loud mouth, of course. Um, and uh, so I did all the talking. I've, I've done hundreds of interviews and uh, spoken at universities, bookstores, and all sorts of things. Um, always by myself. But then uh, the, the invitation from Idea City showed up and she said, Wait a minute, I want to go to this one. <laughs> <laughs> so this one's different. So this is the first time Casilda's is here on stage with me. And uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> so now you can... So I'll carry the weight from here, but if I run over, you intercept Moses, all right? And keep him busy till I finish. Okay, good. Let's uh, get started. So, uh, we published this book about a year ago, Sex at Dawn. That's the paperback version on the right that's coming out in uh, a week, I guess. And uh, essentially what we're talking about in this book is what we call the standard narrative. Uh, very briefly, the standard narrative is what we've all heard. Women are attracted to men who are older, richer, bigger. Why? Because since the beginning of time, women have 
uh, traded sexual fidelity to men in exchange for resources, for protection, for meat, for shelter, for status. We've all heard this story, and it's uh, claimed that this informs our behavior, our mating behavior. Um, in exchange for that status, meat, and so on, men demand the sexual fidelity, and that explains why men are sexually jealous, because men, by nature, according to this narrative, uh, need to know that those are their children. And the only way to uh, know that they're your children is to control your mate's sexual behavior. What we argue in the book is that's not human nature. That's a very recent um, development that's tied to agriculture. Because before agriculture, which started just 10,000 years ago, uh, there was no property to pass on to your children. So it didn't matter who your children were. Property was shared in hunter-gatherer groups. All property is shared, the meat is shared, the protection is shared, the shelter is shared. So this idea that people evolved in these little nuclear families where a man would come home with you know, his bacon, as it were, and uh, only share it with his wife and their children collapses when you look at the actual anthropological evidence. Um, we call it Flintstonization in the book. You, you look around at the way things are, you project it into prehistory and say, oh, great, that's an explanation for how things came to be this way, and it also justifies the way things are today. So it's also a very political thing. Now, how can we possibly know how people behaved in prehistory? Uh, behavior famously doesn't leave any artifacts. So you look at uh, different sources of information and then you triangulate. So we look at the uh, bonobos and chimps, which are the two primates closest to humans by far. And they're equidistant from humans. So if you ever read that chimps are the species closest to humans and therefore the most relevant for understanding human behavior, that's not quite true. Chimps and bonobos are exactly the same distance from humans in terms of DNA. Interestingly, for example, chimps and bonobos are closer to humans than the Indian elephant is to the African elephant. All right, so we're talking about very close genetic relatives. Um, and uh, so the uh, chimps and bonobos are equally relevant. But we, all, we hear about the chimps all the time from Jane Goodall's work, uh, justifying the uh, ancient origins of human violence and so on and so forth. But we rarely hear about the bonobos. And we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. We also look at the pre-agricultural societies that uh, presumably live more or less the way our ancestors did, uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers, immediate uh, return, so whatever they catch or gather, they eat that day or a couple of days. There's no accumulation of resources, no refrigeration, obviously. Uh, we look at uh, anatomy. The body tells you so much about the behavior of your ancestors. You can read a body and we'll be doing a little body reading here in a few minutes. We look at psycho, psycho, psychosexuality, contemporary uh, taste for pornography, what turns people on and off and so on, and then we triangulate. Now, let's do a quick uh, bit of research here. How many of you, by raising your hands, how many of you have heard a heterosexual couple having sex? Okay, just about everyone. Uh, <clears throat> Raise your hand if the man was making more noise than the woman. <laughs> Not a hand. Oh, one, two. Okay, good. Two. Two out of whatever we have here. This is known as female copulatory vocalization uh, in science. And there are actually scientists out there in the jungle with directional microphones listening to monkey sex and uh, recording. Now, what's interesting about female copulatory vocalization is it doesn't appear in monogamous primates or polygonous primates, a harem-based society. It appears in promiscuous primates. Of the hundreds of primates that exist in the world, many of them are social intelligent species that exist in multi-male groups, right? How many of them are monogamous? Zero, unless you count us, right? Okay, so let's move on here. Uh, this just a scheme of uh, shows you how closely related we are to the chimps and the bonobos. Okay, bonobo society is very interesting. I mentioned earlier, it's very different from chimpanzee society. Uh, it's female-centered, the females have the power. 
uh, they exercise the power in coalitions. If a male gets out of line, attacks a female, gives her a hard time, all the females gang up on the male. So, yeah, exactly. That was a man who said yeah, all right? And the reason this man said yeah is because he understands that when women have power, men get laid more often. <laughs> Gentlemen. All right. Uh, it's relatively, extremely nonviolent compared to chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have war, rape, infanticide, you name it, they do it. They're, they're pretty nasty beasts. If you have an enclosure full of chimpanzees and you throw in some food, all hell breaks out. Uh, the ruling coalition of males will take control of the, the resources, whatever it is, some fruit or whatever, and they'll portion it out among their, their uh, cronies, and maybe some of it will filter down to females in estrus, and maybe some, if there's a lot, it'll get down to the babies. We're going to see in a minute what happens when you throw some food into a group of bonobos. Very different. Highly sexual all sorts of sexual interaction going on with bonobos. The only prohibited or, or non-observed uh, non uh, combination is mother-son. Anything else goes. There's no infanticide. In 35, 40 years of observing uh, bonobos in captivity and uh, in the wild, there's never been one observed case of infanticide, of murder, of rape, or of warfare between groups. Not one. Phenomenal. Okay. Uh, the reason bonobos are very interesting is that in human society, as I mentioned, before agriculture, egalitarianism was the central motivating uh, factor. Uh, it's hard for us to understand this today in our you know, me first society, but that's the way we evolved until very recently. If you say, as most scientists do, that anatomically modern humans first came on the scene about 200,000 years ago, and the first signs of agriculture are 10,000 years ago, we're talking about 95% of our existence as anatomically modern humans was in these egalitarian hunter-gatherer groups. So it's extremely relevant to understanding human society. Now, bonobo sexuality, very interesting and relates to some of the earlier uh, talks. It's face to face. They look into each other's eyes when they have sex. Uh, one of the only animals that have sex in the so-called missionary position, <coughs> excuse me, um, often female-induced, all possible combinations, as I said. The great uh, primatologist Franz Duval said that chimpanzees use violence to get sex, whereas bonobos use sex to avoid violence. All right, so these are two, it's almost like the devil and the angel over your shoulder, you know, in the movies. That's sort of what bonobos and chimps are like. And uh, the other thing that's very interesting about bonobo sexuality is the females are capable of having sex at any time, whether they're ovulating or not. That's very unusual in the animal world. And in fact, if you think about how many times a, uh, a typical human has sex in his or her life, and then divide that by the number of children they have, you get a ratio of a thousand or more. Bonobos and chimps are up around 750. Most animals, 15, 20, including primates. Monogamous primates are, are 10 or fewer. So just the fact that we have sex so much tells us something. Now, we've been here for three days talking about ideas having sex, but why do people have sex? If you think the answer is reproduction, I don't think so. We obviously, 99.999% of the sex we have doesn't result in any offspring. So for humans, our thesis is that human sexuality evolved as a social bonding device. And it's a very important part of pre-agricultural societies, these egalitarian societies that shared everything. They're raising the children together, they're sharing the food, so why wouldn't they share sexual pleasure as well? It has uh, significant advantages. Okay, this is what happens when you throw apples into a bonobo enclosure.
Okay, that's from, yes. That was uh, uh, sent to us by Vanessa Woods, who wrote a book called Bonobo Handshake. I encourage you to check it out. If you, yes, Vanessa's friend. Um, okay, I have to go quickly. We're running out of time here, so I'm going to run through this. Uh, bonobos, as I mentioned, have this, uh, they, they um, have the sexual swelling, but they swell pretty much through 80% of their menstrual cycle, uh, and they're not ovulating all that time. It's just they're always ready and up for it, so to speak. Um, okay, now, sexual swelling. You might think this is uh, only uh, restricted to primates, but no, we see it in Victorian society, uh, this echo of uh, female genital swelling, and you might think it's uh, restricted to Victorian society, but it's not. Meet the butt bra. You can get this uh, online right now and in finer lingerie stores. Uh, <laughs> So it's pretty obvious what's going on there. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, we'll skip through that. This, I would love to spend uh, 17 minutes just talking about this, my, the only chart I've ever made, actually. Uh, I'm very proud of it, all sorts of information on there, but... Okay, now... Uh... <laughs> Here we see gorillas are a harem-based society. One male uh, controls the females. The males fight, so the biggest, strongest male takes over the harem. So the genes for strength, ferocity, and size are favored. You get bigger and bigger males. Uh, male gorilla is about twice the size and weight of a female gorilla. Whereas in uh, bonobos and Italians, you have uh, the competition taking place on the level of the sperm cell more than the individual level. Uh, by the way, this guy's a friend of ours and uh, he uh, permits us to use this. <laughs> and he lives in India, so he'll never know anyway. Uh, a gorilla's testicles are the size of kidney beans. They're located up inside the abdomen. A gorilla's penis is the size of your pinky finger from here. It's uh, a pretty strong indication. Bonobo's uh, testicles are the size of chicken eggs. All right, and it's not only Italians we're talking about. We also see some Americans uh, <laughs> with the famous packet. And it's not only uh, primates even. Um, and actually, it, it's not only animals that have external testicles. You also find it in <laughs> your finer automobiles. Okay, <laughs> good, all right, so uh, now I just, I have one minute left and what I'd like to say with that last minute is that our book, uh, despite appearances, is not an indictment of monogamy, it's not an argument against monogamy, as uh, Moses said, we've been married for 12 years, whether those have been monogamous years or not, we're not commenting, uh, but uh, my parents have been married for 50 years. Uh, happily. Uh, uh, I have utmost respect for monogamy as a lifestyle choice. It can be a wonderful choice. It's like choosing to be a vegetarian. It can be healthy, it can be ethical, it can be socially uh, adaptive, um, but just because you've chosen to be a vegetarian doesn't mean bacon's going to stop smelling good. <laughs> and that's the, the thought that we'd like to leave you with today. Thank you. So we get on each side. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.